I jumped ahead. While we're queuing this up, our, our main thrust of these verses and what we'll be looking at even in this section and really a theme throughout James is God is sovereign over all our trials, which are designed to bring us to maturity. By recognizing this, having the proper attitude and asking God for wisdom, we are able to endure the trials of life through his grace and to his glory. Okay. So hopefully we were working on this before. One minute, especially watch the third raft. First one bypasses on the left at the top of your screen there. That's why the videographer doesn't really follow it. Number two here you can see is already turned around going backwards. There's the main feature. <laughs> oh, sandwich. Good save in the front. And they made it. Number three, not so fortunate. They're stuck. They're paddling. They're going. Uh, well, this other crew right here coming up next didn't even make it to the main feature. They flipped already. Oh. Well, number three's still there. Number five is going by now. Three's got whirled around a couple of times now. They're still going in. Um, we're going to see what, oh, there they go. Okay, and there goes number five. Well, just for some imagery with that, um, you get the, the idea here. Trials in life can spin us around, can flip the raft, can bounce us down the river for a long ways. Um, we'll life <laughs> together. And in this life, James says, we are going to encounter many trials. For many of us, our lives have been marked by difficult days. Some over a long period of time have been wrestling with illness or family issues. Circumstances that seem to never, ever quit. Some have trying relationships. Others have unfulfilled hopes and dreams. Still others buffeted by disappointment, doubts, and darkness. Loss is painful. Trials are difficult. And troubles hurt. And into this, we walk into James chapter 1, verse 2. Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials. Okay. Later in James... We'll see that various trials could include being dragged into court in chapter 2, lacking material resources later in chapter 2, verbal abuse in chapter 3 and chapter 4, being victims, victims of divisiveness and quarreling in chapter 4, um, economic injustices later in chapter four, um, 5, sickness in chapter 5, and all kinds of trouble that we see in verse 5.13. But, but here in verse 2, consider it all joy, my brother. But here in verse 2, Sam Elberry noted, James deliberately keeps his language general. Okay? And it's great that he does. It's easy when undergoing hardship to think that our particular situation is different from everybody else's. That the normal rules don't apply. That we're an exception to the rest. But by keeping his language broad, James is showing us that what he is about to say would applies to all of us. If he had specified a particular trial he had in mind, it'd be too easy for the rest of us facing different situations to excuse ourselves from what he's saying. Now, James is sensitive to what his people, his readers at the time, and his readers now, he's sensitive to what we are facing. And he addresses very quickly, he jumps right into it in verse 2, right? <laughs> and very practically, the facts of life, which are inescapable, unavoidable, and experienced by everyone. Namely, that the Christian life is full of tests and trials. And what does James say? Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials. Now, I came to appreciate the Phillips translation when I was listening to a few of Alistair Begg's sermons in the last few weeks. And, and in the Phillips paraphrase, verse 2 reads like this. When all kinds of trials and temptations crowd into your lives, my brothers, don't resent them as intruders, but welcome them as friends. What? That's the, right? You all chuckle because that's our normal response. To, to welcome trials as friends is not the normal response. The normal response is not to lean in. 
The normal response is to shy away. Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials. When you're stalled out in a raft, if I may go back to the rafting analogy, when you feel like you've been paddling for all you're worth and you're going nowhere. When the raft slipped over and all you can do is cling on. When you feel like you just get pulled under again and again and again. Or you're wondering, how many rocks am I going to bounce off before this ride is done? Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials. Consider it. This is a command, an imperative. It's a verb that addresses how we think. It's also a financial term. That's why you see it translated count in many versions. And that really means to evaluate. So it's important to recognize what he's not saying. Okay? As Blomberger and Campbell put it, James does not command us to wear our happy faces. Okay? The happy faces that so many seem to think are required in church and other Christian circles. If we recognize that this is everybody's encounter, we will all face various trials. We don't need the happy face. He's not suggesting that trials in and of themselves are a source of joy, but what he is saying is this. They may become occasions of rejoicings if we respond to them from the right perspective. Several years ago, we had a, a gentleman with special needs on one of our trips, and as we began our rafting journey, you could see his apprehension. He was really quiet, tentative. And Bruce and I both had our eyes on him. When we hit one of the first series of rapids, he left the raft. Well, when he came up out of the water, you should have seen his face. Not pretty. <laughs> but we got in another raft. I actually got in, I was in a different raft, so we were close. We could go get him to come up. We hit a slower moving section, encouraging him to swim too, haul him up in. Well, once he realized he was okay, we actually had to dissuade him from jumping back in the river the rest of the way down. <laughs> so from stone faced, fearful, apprehensive, he is now just beaming with elation the rest of the wave. And we had some more serious ones than the ones that knocked him out in the first place. But his change in perspective when he realized, I'm going to be okay. This is actually fun. Now that's a bit of stress many of us will think when we're in the midst of it. Hmm, am I getting joy out of this <laughs> or not? But perspective is crucial. The right perspective is fundamental to the right response. Unless we think correctly, we cannot respond properly. It is thinking correctly that enables us to respond properly. Sometimes we wonder why the minor trials are even there. And then when the major trials come, the tragedies, the difficulties that make the everyday trials seem so small. We wonder what James is thinking when he tells us to consider all of these things as pure joy. It takes some renewing of the mind, doesn't it? Because it's a paradox, isn't it? But God is not asking from us what he's unable or unwilling to provide for us. Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials. It's much the same as we see one book before in Hebrews, where the writer of the Hebrews says in, in chapter 12, verse 11, no punishment is enjoyable at the time, but it produces the peaceable fruit of righteousness for those who have been trained by it. Now, I'm not equating trials to punishment here. Just try to see the train of thought. No punishment is enjoyable at the time, but it produces the peaceful fruit of righteousness for those who have been trained by it. When a child is disciplined, if they stiffen their necks, if they grow resilient and resistant to it, they're not really trained by it. At least not in the way we were hoping. Now, 
I may be alone in this, but probably many of us can look back into our own childhood and admit to seeing this in ourselves. And as parents, we may even have seen this in our own children at times. You might think of it this way, that any benefit we receive from going through trials and difficulties is directly related to the perspective which which we view them and the spirit in which we respond to them. Jesus said in in John 16, verse 33, In the world (coughs) you will have tribulations, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. God is encouraging us here to embrace trials not so much for what they are, but what for God sovereignly accomplishes through them. David Platt would suggest that we can learn at least four things in trials that should cause us to rejoice. Um, As we'll look at today, don't worry, three and four is enough for today. We'll do five through 12 next week, and sorry, you're stuck with me one more time. In verses 3 and 4, we we learn to grow in his likeness. In verses 5 through 8, we learn to trust in his wisdom. In verses 9 through 11, we learn to rely on his resources. And in verse 12, we learn to live for his reward. Let's move into verses 3 and 4 where he outlines the process or the sequence that results in the finished product. So starting with verse 2, Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance, and let endurance have its perfect result, so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Again, I came to appreciate the Phillips paraphrase of this, Starting again with verse 2. When all kinds of trials and temptations crowd into your lives, my brothers, don't resent them as intruders, but welcome them as friends. Realize that they come to test your faith and to produce in you the quality of endurance. But let the process go on until that endurance is fully developed and you will find you have become men of mature character. Again, verse 3. Knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. So first of all, there's faith. Right there. Before it can be tested, faith has to be present. James is writing here not to people who are interested in religion, but he's writing to people who have come to understand that Jesus is their Savior. They're aware of the fact that by their nature they are unfit and that they're unable to rectify their circumstances, and they have discovered in Jesus the only one who can save them, deliver them. They are people who have received him and who have believed in him, who have placed their faith in him. So we have faith. Then faith put to the test, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. Trials are the means by which our faith, our Christian life, is tested. The test is to look for the genuine nature of faith, and the test is to look for the growing nature of faith. Warren Wiersbe puts it this way, if if you recall the idea of count, means to evaluate It'll help tie into this quote from Warren Wiersbe. He put it this way. Our values determine our evaluations. If we value comfort more than character, our trials will upset us. If we value the material and the physical more than the spiritual, we will not be able to count it all joy. If we live for the present and forget the future, then trials will make us bitter, not better. We see also following James in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 6 through 9. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been distressed by various trials. So that the proof of your faith be more precious than gold, which is perishable, even though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor 
at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And though you have not seen him, you love him. And though you do not see him now, but believe in him, you greatly rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, obtaining as the outcome of your faith the salvation of your souls. How do we find out whether we have genuine faith? In the test, in the middle of the trials. Back to verse 3. Knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. So we have faith, then faith put to the test, which produces endurance. All right, anybody run a marathon? I got a few. Half marathon, 5K. That's a little more my style. All right. Now, Lisa used to run marathons. I didn't train with her. I rode the bike and carried the water. Okay. Now, most of you that have run marathons and those thinking about running it recognize that you don't just get up and run a marathon. You, you typically have to train for it. You have to build your endurance. Just like muscle training, it has to be stretched. It has to be worked for it to get larger. Okay. Now, I'm more to couch to 5K, and even then, <laughs> you have to start slow. And the last time I did it, my knees didn't make it, so we're done. Now, our Heavenly Father knows how much we can take, much more so than the best trainer or coach. Back to verse 2. Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance, and let endurance have its perfect result, so that you may be perfect and complete and lacking in nothing. Recall Philippians 1.6. For I am confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. And the good work that he brings to completion is to make us like Jesus, to bring us to maturity. The idea of perfect and complete here is completeness in Christ, of rounding, not just one thing, but full rounding. And if we think again, back to Philippians 1, thing, 6, in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus, we won't be perfect until that day. Well, the downside of that is that means he's got to keep working on us till that day. Again, consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials. So we have faith. Faith put to the test, which builds endurance, which leads to Christ-likeness. If we stop and think about this is what we should long most for, to become more whole or complete in Christ, to know Him more fully and intimately. And it is trials that give us this opportunity to mature in our faith. In fact, the evidence in Scripture says we can't get there without trials. This is how Christian life works. Faith grows through learning to persevere in hardship. Now, we all know there's degrees, just like there's classes of rapids. Trials take various forms. The Apostle Paul says something similar in his letter to the Roman church in Romans 5, verses 3 to 4. And not only this, but we also exult in our tribulations, knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance, and perseverance, proven character, and proven character, hope. Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance, and let endurance have its perfect result, so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Verse 12 ends this section. Blessed is a man who perseveres under trial, for once he's been approved, he'll receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Do we believe it? Many more of you now don't know Lynn Holm, but many of you that do, if you remember, Lynn Holm used to say, do you really believe what you say you believe? Because if we do, it will dramatically change how we respond to our trials. Let's pray. 
Father, we thank you so much that we can turn to your word, that all of your promises find their yes and their amen in the Lord Jesus. Holy Spirit, help us when we're tempted to see trials and difficulties as a waste. Bring to our minds and train us by your truth. Help us to recognize that it is the reverse that is actually true. Your word here in James requires a supernatural response, and without your Spirit's power, we can't even come close. Lord, we pray that the joyfulness and the clarity of your truth may help us as we go about this coming week. May we be distinctive in our Christian living, not in the fact that we have been removed from the realm of trials, but that you have given us an altogether different perspective. And we've begun to understand the process that you have in order to bring us to maturity and to completeness in Christ. We ask all of this in Jesus' name and for his sake.